Good morning, everyone. My name is Sheena Lauerson, and I am from the Danish Science Center Experimentarium, and I'm also a member of the Excite Program Committee. I'm very happy to introduce not only one keynote speaker today, but two. In line with this year's Creative Collisions theme, Julia and Jill Enders are sharing this keynote, and it is actually the first ever dual keynote at an Excite conference. I think it wonderfully echoes this year's Creative Collisions theme. Their collaborative work is indeed an example of how creativity and innovation can enhance the, community, the communication of science. Julia Enders is the author and Jill Enders the illustrator of the internationally acclaimed book, Got the Inside Story of Our Body's Most Underrated Organ. What's really up with gluten and lactose intolerance? And how does the gut affect obesity and mood? These are two of many questions that the book poses and aims to offer answers to. For too long, the gut has been the body's most ignored and least appreciated organ. But it does more than just dirty work. Our gut is at the core of who we are. But why then is this area so neglected in the medical world? Julie Anders is a me medical doctor and aimed to reveal the secrets and science of the digestive system. Jill Anders is a graphic designer whose main focus is the communication of science. And Jill visualizes the science of the digestive system with wonderful and humorous illustrations. I think that you both succeed in doing what we as science centers and museums strive to do, engaging us in science and making science relatable and important to us, as well as enlightening us with scientific knowledge. When I read your book on the gut, I kept wanting to turn to the next page, as if I was reading a novel and couldn't wait to find out what would be happening next. Your magnificent way of using humor and short anecdotes, along with scientific explanations, helps us as readers to learn, understand, and realize the relevance. I find myself telling my children and friends how best to sit on the toilet or mention that we produce less saliva at night or explain why we are tired after lunch. Um, and I have a little fun fact for you. In Danish, the word for the gut is actually tarm, and the translation of the book is tarm with charm. Um, and uh, Julia and Julie both know this and they think that it's actually quite a good translation. <laughs> Uh, so for all these reasons and more, your book, The Gut, has become a worldwide bestseller. And if you haven't read this book, I can warn you to be careful because I think it's slightly addictive. And it might just make you listen to those butterflies in your stomach and realize they're trying to tell you something important. So please help me welcome Julia and Jill Enders to the stage. Hello, um, my name is Julia Enders. Hi, my name is Jill. We are very excited to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> and as you just said so beautifully, we are invited here because we wrote a book together, this book. Um, in German, it's called Da mit Charm, which translates to Charming Bows or Charmin mit Charmin, as you just said. And um, we were very happy to see that this book got quite um, a good start, and it's sold to uh, over 40 countries and was sold over 3.5 million times. Um, and it didn't only surprise us, or was a good thing for us, but it also in the discussion with people from the book industry surprised, uh, but even sometimes shocked them um, that such a weird, embarrassing topic would reach such a broad audience. And oftentimes we think that one very underestimated factor of this success is actually our interdisciplinary way of working together. And when you turn around the book and open the book and look a little closer, then you see the both of us in the right upper corner. And um, what we will talk about today is a little bit about our collaborative work on guiding the reader through an experience. Oh, can you not hear well, sir? Or because he's waving. Can everybody hear? 
Yeah? Okay. Um, we want to talk a little bit about how we guide the reader um, through such a sometimes difficult topic. And in the second part, we will talk about how we guided actually ourselves through the process of making this book. It was our first book we did together. But first, we have to make a very honest disclaimer. We weren't perfect in collaborating from the start. We have had many years of extensive experimenting with collaborative interdisciplinary work, and um, we've actually made some very typical mistakes, like this. <laughs> so here you see my sister standing very brave, and I'm jumping over her. I did that a lot of times, and I had a lot of fun, <laughs> but now my sister probably has a different view on this, let's say. <laughs> a little bit. So let's summarize. If there is only one person who gets to flourish while the other one is just standing there and is not using the full potential, um, this might not work long for a long period of time. And I'm glad that it didn't work for a long time. <laughs> but also here you can see that it's important to sometimes strictly separate the areas of responsibility and the areas of, um, well, what your talent is, what you're doing. Because um, you see, like, I dressed my sister and my sister also dressed herself. So if this is the case, you just wear too many clothes. And even if the collaboration is going very well, there's always a danger to it that you stay in your little mindset too long and you don't have the influence from the outside um, that might be actually helpful for yourself and also for your work. And this happened to us a few times, but it also especially happened when we were working together with others, that we felt, for example, the publisher would say, no, in our experience, this is how we've always done it, or our marketing team knows what people like. And um, so sometimes we thought it's really good to question this box of thinking when you're a very um, team for a long time to also question ourselves sometimes. So despite spending some time together, it was also very important for us that we spend some time apart. Um, I dropped into um, my studies. I studied communication or graphic design. And the first thing I did is I made a lot of books. And I was sitting on my desk studying to be good enough to get into med school. And one of my main focuses at that time um, was when I discovered old forgotten plants and food in a new kind of way. And I got into med school and was still sitting at my desk. <laughs> and I worked on, I worked with the um, local history, uh, natural history museum. Um, on their work, they explained me what they did, and I kind of translated it into a visual language. And I had my first exam and <laughs> studied on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I found it together with a friend. I founded a network um, with scientists and designers where the designer present the work of the scientists in a visual way while I got into the lab from my desk <laughs> and was working on my doctorate degree. <laughs> and finally, all these steps led us to work together again on this book we will talk about today. And what we discovered very early on was that we weren't so different as we had thought we were before. One of us was thinking in very verbal, fact-oriented way, and the other one was thinking in a very visual um, way of structuring knowledge. And we always thought we did completely different things, but when we first started working together on like a, a little evening talk for students, my, I asked my sister if she could make some funny slides for me. Um, then we realized, oh, it, it goes quite well, because uh, it's so easy. You have the same idea of what I'm talking about, but in a visual way, while I still have just the words. So we realized this works uh, surprisingly well.
And we weren't even together. We were, I was in Berlin and she was in Frankfurt. So we were far apart and we just had these telephone conversations and I sent her a picture. And so this collaboration was kind of like a ping pong. So I think the honest disclaimer shows we had some really getting to knowing each other, knowing our expertise, trusting the other one's expertise, and then also, I mean, some very like overlining, overlapping ways of thinking that made it at times easier for us, I think, than for people who don't know each other. The first thing we had to tackle together in our collaborative way of working was how do we guide the reader through a topic that everybody or many people maybe have quite a lot of emotions connected to it. Emotions like shame, things like this being disgusted by something, or being even scared, or having a body image of yourself about an organ that is very weak. It's usually just the weak times when you got, get to know your gut, like diarrhea or vomiting, you feel weak. So how do we uh, try and approach to change this um, with picture and with um, words? And the first big lesson we had in doing that, or doing that wrong actually, was when we tried to find the first text for the book. We sat together and we were playing thoughts back and forth and we say, okay, um, oh, how about, how we do about, we do that, how about we do that? And then in the end we said, okay, now we got it. We say, dear reader, follow me like Alice follows the white rabbit. Just don't ask which hole we're gonna fall into. <laughs> And we laughed very much and we were like, I five, this is so funny and we have it all figured out. And I think we even went to the kitchen and had like a celebratory snack. <laughs> so we really thought, oh, we're the champs of this, we're gonna do this right. And then I think it was, it hit us at the same time, about 20 minutes later, both of us were like, had like the last spoon in our mouth and we're like, we can't do this. And the funny thing was really that it hit both of us at the same time. We like felt the, the like laugh not coming out anymore. And we like looked at each other and we just had to say, we think this doesn't work like this. So both from a picture way, just started thinking about pictures, how to do this. And I was like, words, and we're like, no. <laughs> because we thought that some readers are not that far yet because we haven't been so far at the beginning, we just learned. So when we did this um, intro, we already knew a lot about the gut, so we could make these kind of jokes, but we thought we should address the reader somewhere else for the beginning to really put him into this book. Yeah. So this is usually um, what readers would see and this is what we would see when we started out reading about this topic. Yeah, we started pretty simple. We just googled to see what pictures are out there and most of the times you see something like this. So, I mean, it's not bad, but it's just this like pinkish wobbly thing um, which is maybe sometimes slimy or people sometimes think um, like if you look in, um, into the inside of it, it's all like dirty, which is not the case. But it has so much more to it. And when we knew it, we knew that we wanted to present it in a different way. And also the language used to describe the gut usually has very distinct patterns. It's always like, oh, don't you know how embarrassing it is when this happens? Or, ooh, these rumbling noises. Or, my tummy hurt. So it's always make more re relating to the people on like an embarrassing or don't you know how bad it is level. And not like, it's making more fun of how weak it can be rather than showing the mechanisms behind it. At least in like public magazines and stuff like this. So to transition to a different way of showing it or another perspective that we had gotten by then had to be really smooth because otherwise people would feel a bit fooled or what is this, is it a children book or are you making fun of it? Like it had to be a smooth transition. And we realized that it wasn't only the, the words or pictures, but also really the order in which happened by this, uh, making this joke in the beginning, we realized, oh, it, it's a funny joke, but it, it doesn't work in this order. So after that, we really learned the order of the rest of the book has to be in a way that makes sense. So at first we will use a topic, the, the organs, when you eat food, when you go to the toilet, something you can see and something you can also feel. And in the second chapter, we will talk about the nervous system because 
vomiting or constipation, um, you can feel it, but you can't really see what's going on. And then you, we could go to the third chapter, at least we thought we could do that then, um, to see the invisible microbes that you can't see or you can't feel. And one of the most important emotions, of course, was shame. Um, shame is something we now think can be easily dissolved um, with curiosity or other measurements. And we didn't do this in a strategic way. I think we also didn't look through psychology books or really thought of, oh, now we do this, now we do that. But looking back on it, we intuitively did um, quite a few techniques that we kept repeating every time it came back to something sh that was shameful. And especially in the first chapter, this emotion had to be resolved and lightened up a little bit. So one thing we used quite a few times, uh, and especially in the first text of the book, was to create neutral common ground. Um, if you look at the world, we say, hey, look at it. Trees are, do kind of look like spoons, but they really are roots. And we all know this, right? So um, then it would be easier to have this common ground a bit away from all the shame and emotions and just say, and the brain is very well um, looked up upon, and the heart we think is very important, and the gut really is just the third part of a triangle. And the second um, your part is um, about going to the toilet. And when my sister found out how this works, she told me and we were, we were totally fascinating about it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just explain you what you see. Um, you have this one guy and he, um, is, um, he presents the outer sphincter and the outer sphincter is more for the outside world. So it's like, what is going out outside? Is it possible to go to the toilet or do we hold it in for a little bit longer? And the second sphincter is more for yourself, so it lets to feel you comfortable and it looks after yourself and it says, no, this needs to go out, so please find a way to do this. <laughs> and um, we talked a lot about it. And when we found out that we wanted to share this, we said, okay, maybe let's do characters because then you will get um, the tension we wanted to um, say to the reader immediately. So I did this drawing and it, I showed it to my sister and it was a bit different at the beginning. Um, you had the guy and the guy looked a bit strict and my sister said, no, this is too strict. Somehow it has to be a bit different. So I looked in my environment who I will find who is kind of likely to be that person. And I found the one, it was um, the roommate of my boyfriend at that time. And he was, uh, yeah, he was into politics. So he cared a lot about what other people might think about him. But he also was very responsible for a lot of people, not only for himself. Um, so. I kind of did this portrait and when the book came out, we told him and we thought like, oh, he would be so amused by this, but he wasn't amused at all. <laughs> Just his face dropped down and I didn't know what to say, but I thought it was quite a compliment to be a good asshole in a way. <laughs> And actually, um, also uh, this way we could go a little bit away from shame and focus more on really how something works. Um, and um, the important thing we always kept reminding ourselves, each other back and forth, would, okay, that's interesting, that's, that looks nice or that sounds interesting, but f stay helpful, stay actually helpful. Um, so it's cool to understand all the sphincters, but if there's nothing that you get out of it, really, um, people, some people might lose interest when it continues to go like this. So there always needs to be a rewarding thing that you get from understanding something. So it's really good now that you understand that there is also a muscle around the end of the colon that pulls back on it when you sit or uh, sit in the right angle or stand. Um, and it's cool to know that if your legs go a little bit higher, this uh, muscle relaxes and you don't need so much pressure to go to the toilet. So you have less risks of hemorrhoids or diverticulosis. So having this knowledge can help you actually for many people every day. 
Um, and uh, we always try to stay as helpful as possible. And for this picture, my sister wanted to get it really right, especially the angle, where how the legs go up, because that tends to be difficult for some people. It's a 30 degree angle, if you're curious. And um, she made me sit as a model for this picture. And I'm just very glad she changed my hairstyle. And it's also very funny because when I get um, invited into new homes I haven't seen before <laughs> and I go to the toilet and I see this little chair somewhere, I know that they have read the book. <laughs> <laughs> And something we also did, and I especially like this example because um, we, without knowing, we did something very similar technically. Um, when we talked about the text about looking in your mouth and understanding the structure, like where does the saliva comes out? It comes out here, and that's why sometimes there's more um, stones in the teeth or something. So to really be curious and follow us into this journey, um, we both provoke curiosity. In the text, I use the example of saying, you know, these very nicely dressed secretaries, they might go home and they have wild ferrets there. Or there might be a rock musician who listens to like soft romantic Romantic music sometimes in the car when there's nobody with them. So they provoke a little bit curiosity and um, telling that when we come look closer, there might be something surprising or interesting. And my sister did the same thing, um, but just with her picture. And we didn't really talk about this, but she drew the way where the saliva glands come out um, like a crime scene, you know, like when you're investigating a crime and finding a criminal. So we both um, wanted to provoke this element of curiosity at this part of the book. And when the reader went through all the things we just mentioned, and then he is open for a, a new world. And this was a part that was a lot of fun for us to make um, because we could have just, we opened our minds and made just things up which would kind of match to the things we wanted to explain. So we just explained the things that everyone knows from their own body but in our own world and in our own language and I think by this point now it works pretty well. And I think you can tell that order is important because starting a book and talking about the back of your tongue where immune cells reside and watch out what strange things you put in your mouth, having a picture like this on the first page would be irritating to many people, I think, or they would be like, eh, what is this? And um, having it a little bit further in the back, I think worked well. And then the thing is, when you go into another world, this other world you take them to can even be deeply scientific. If you look at this picture also, we maybe couldn't have put this on the first page because some people are scared off by scientific pictures. And if you promise to stay helpful during explaining those deeply scientific things in a fantasy or sometimes a bit more, a little bit more abstract way. It's not like a made up story, but sometimes we use different words or funnier pictures. If you continue to stay helpful, you can even go deeper. And now looking at this picture, I think uh, many people who are not so much into science or who are scared that they won't understand it, um, like they sometimes come across science studies in school, they feel like they're too stupid or something, they would be scared off by a picture like this and maybe wouldn't want to read all the text explaining everything. But, well, at least we hoped until then we've provoked their curiosity, we showed them it's helpful to understand there's some common ground always for all of us and you can identify with many things. We didn't only guide our reader, we also really worked on guiding ourselves through this process. And I think um, one of the first things that we have very different angles on um, is this. Um, we both really like this story. It's the second chapter. And um, I, we both had, um, yeah, well, I, my experience was that I wanted to write about the muscle movements, right? Um, and many people have this with reflux, they have to vomit from time to time, or they have very, very slow movements, so they have constipation. And um, I felt like it's important to really show that there's mus muscle movements, how they work, and um, that 
they can be even elegant, even a fart can look elegant when you just look at the muscle movement. And I immediately had this idea, I wanted to do a ballet of gut muscle movements. But I was very insecure about this idea because it felt a bit, uh, if I don't get the exact right words, people will think it's like I'm making fun of it or it's a bit naive or romantic even to talk about something like this in that way. Um, so I didn't know if I would stick with this idea. I <laughs> wobbled around it many times. It took me very long. And I sh showed the text to my sister, and she immediately gave me such a drawing back. And I, in this moment, I was very relieved because I thought, oh, okay, people who will see this, I think within a second, they will sort of get there's a bit of humor in it. It's not taking yourself too seriously. And it also is supposed to show the, how, that it's beautiful. Um, so this, those are my intentions. And I think when you've seen this picture, maybe I can be a bit more relaxed when talking about it. And when she gave me the text and I read it, I thought this idea was a really nice idea. And I liked it. And I just got to this drawing, which I think is quite positive as well. And I think this is probably one of the biggest things or one of the things I'm very grateful that I learned from my sister, that she always stays positive. So like when she is um, writing a text, she's not focusing on things that might go wrong or that are not good for us. She's focusing at first on the positive thing and, to, and shows them in a very beautiful way. And even if the things are not good for us or there are no, no, no good things, um, she explains why it is that way. And if you explain things, then you realize that there is a reason to it and it's not so bad anymore. So for my work when I went on, I always remember this in my mind that I always try to um, stay positive when I begin things. And I also learned quite something from my sister, especially when it came to the third chapter, which was talking about bacteria. And this is a huge area of science which drops new knowledge um, day to day. And it seemed very big and a bit too big sometimes to structure this and how to guide into this from something visible, organs, and then t suddenly something tiny, small. Ugh, and I struggled really with that and I went to my sister and I said there's so much stuff in my head and I don't know how to put it down and she just like gave me a little water to drink and said sit, sit down and just tell me all this chaos and then I told her all the things and sometimes this is also a very good um, thing between us because I tend to be blah 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 like talkative a lot and she will calmly listen and then stop me and ask good questions. And that way um, she said, okay, wait, we have to find some common ground here. And I had to talk in a way that a visual person gets what I'm saying. So we had to communicate in a way so that there's common ground. And she would start to grasp onto things and then say, all right, so stop from the beginning. Okay, there's a world, there are people, and then there are bacteria, right? And I was like, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and this visual way of structuring knowledge just totally helped me in that moment to find a verbal way to structure the knowledge. And um, by doing that over and over again, having to talk to somebody who thinks visual um, and find a common ground, I think we, um, it made it easier for us to produce something that a broader audience has access to, something that visual people will have an easier time when going through a text, and verbal people um, will also have uh, understand it. So I think by uh, combining two ways of thinking, um, yeah, we just reach a broader audience. And um, here you see different bacteria in your belly. And if I would have drawn this um, in a scientific right way, uh, there would be just the bacteria's bodies, like how they really look like. They look kind of like capsules. You probably know that. Um, but I thought that if I draw it that way, we lose the point we really want to communicate because we don't want to show exactly how they look like. We want to tell the reader that there is a, an entire community inside your belly and they all do good things, not always good, but they all do things for us. 
So um, in making it like this, it just shows you different bacteria, and some of them make you a bit more chubby and some of them can make you more slim or then there are kind of heroes in the gut who can do a lot of things and there are the, um, bacteria who can split food for us so we get uh, better access to vitamins and this is really the point we wanted to say. But we didn't only guide the reader or guide us to um, uh, a better um, collaboration and better results by listening to the other one. We also really guided us in the communication with um, other people, like especially the publisher or people who were surprised by what kind of book this is. And of course, we were not the first people to write a science book and not even the first to write a popular science book on bodily issues. Of course, that we did something many people had done before us, um, but still there were a few um, books like this, for example, in Germany, dominating this area, and so publishers had a very distinct idea what these kind of looks, books would talk about and how the, what they would say and how they would look and what the title would be, um, and they proposed something similar like this, and the title was not supposed to be Charming Balls rather than something like Lucky Belly or Eight Meters Wellness in Your Belly or something like this, and um, sometimes um, I for example, I felt the title was important to me, but after a while I just got really tired and I didn't expect so many discussions over a topic like this. And sometimes I thought maybe they are right, maybe they have all the experience, but if their marketing says so, I don't know. And then my sister would say, but tell me the reasons why you think this is better. And I would tell her and she said, no, I still think it sounds logic what you say, so stand up for it maybe. And then I would. And the other way around, when they gave the um, cover, the, the design, they gave it away to an agency and said they do it always. It has to supposed to be kind of like that. And when I looked at it, I was very upset because I know my sister and I just couldn't find her on this picture. And I don't know, I just missed out on something. So um, I told them and we went back and forth and tried to find a good way, but um, it wasn't so easy. And my sister said, no, really try to fight it and try to get the right way. So it, we ended up that I designed the cover and Julia got the t title she wanted to have. Which I have to say, I made my sister design the cover a little bit. And we just wanted to look, how would it look if you did it? And then we really liked it. And we said, maybe try this instead. And so I think in the end, we were happy about it. Sometimes we weren't sure if we were being bitchy or if we were being too much in our box of thinking. But we still had arguments. And we didn't find the other points invalid. Like when we started out with this poop joke or Alice uh, follows the white rabbit joke, we. Um, there were moments when we would tell each other, no, I don't, I don't think you're right here. And then there were other moments uh, where we would um, think, I think you're right here and you should stand up. And I think this way we could make sure faster if something was just an insecurity or something maybe really was wrong than if we would have been alone and put it back and forth in our head. And we were happy to do that because actually many people then followed a little bit our way of doing a title or our way of doing a cover. And um, yeah, I think it turned out really nice, not jumping over each other's head, but being a two-headed body. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Thanks. And now we're very curious for your questions. Yes, so if there's any questions, and I would just like to also say thank you. You're not only wonderful writers and illustrators, but wonderful speakers <laughs> to engage uh, this very curious audience as well. Um, uh, do we have any questions? It can be stupid questions too. <laughs> yes. I think we, we you have to remember to push the button on the mic. I, I think I saw somebody waving, but I, yeah, yeah. it's yeah um, up there. Hi there. I was just wondering if you received any uh, backlash from the uh, academic community. Sometimes researchers or people who are actually doing science 
are hesitant to present their work into such, in such popular formats. Um, actually, I was expecting that because it's sort of like a second hobby in Germany to criticize. It's soccer and then criticize. Um, so, <laughs> so I was pretty much ready for this. I have to say I was very shocked when I found out at the end of writing that a publishing house is not, uh, it's not a normal practice that there's a scientist reading everything, proofreading everything. So I was like, oh, so there's not like one science guy sitting in this office and doing that? And it turned out, no. So I got so nervous, I double checked every source I had, sometimes triple checked. So the fear was one way of getting things right, I think. And um, yeah, then it also worked out. And I was surprised that I actually did not get a lot or, or really like did not really get backlash. Like sometimes um, people on Amazon are not happy, but uh, not the majority. So, and even the scientific community embraced me very positively. Like two of my professors asked me to talk during their lecture for a few minutes, and um, even some science centers invited me to look at the uh, the stuff they're doing. So um, I was uh, surprised, <laughs> but positively. And I think also a lot of that is also due to the drawings. Um, because they really explain the wiggle room well. So if you see like a butt looking at you, you're not gonna say, but the taxonomy is not in here or something. So this helped to get clear what space I was occupying. More questions? Yep. Hi. So when you started to work on the book, can you tell us who your intended audience was for the reader? And then can you tell us, do you know who's actually buying the book and reading it now? <laughs> uh, so we thought everyone might read this book because everyone has a gut. I thought we started out by this and thought, OK, well, there is a, could be a broad audience. And I think once you say things like, oh, this is how you go to the toilet, you're not really excluding too many people <laughs> if you're doing it in a charming way. So. And I think at the beginning, we had no idea who was buying the book. Mm. But so this was very interesting when Julia did the reading. What's it says? Yeah. When, when Julia did the readings, and then we kind of found out what people would come to her readings and listen to. Her, so. Which is actually a pretty mixed audience. There are quite a few young people, and then especially like um, middle-aged women who drag their men along and say, he didn't want to read it, I made him, and then he loved it, <laughs> or something like this. So we felt like it was actually a pretty mixed audience, and I think the thing I liked a lot was also that after the readings, young and older people and all kinds of people would get into a conversation about this topic because it's just so broad. Um, so I don't think, I, I think maybe this was just a benefit of our topic, really. Um, but then also we didn't like say, oh, we have to use this word because it'll make uh, young women go, wee. But we rather thought like, we really just wanted to make it so good, we really like it. And that was the only thought in our head. Yes, um, and to always stay helpful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it turns out actually a broad audience, I would say the, the majority looks like um, health-oriented people still, but even the ones they make it read. <laughs> yeah. And it turned out to be a good present. Huh? Yeah, it's a good so. present. I think that's also a part of why it sells well. It's also good uh, for people who are a little bit like uh, feeling insecure about visiting somebody in the hospital who has something with the gut. They'd be like, mm, read this funny book. <laughs> so this is one effect we also saw. Yeah. And when I was going into the bookstore for the first time to see the real book in the bookstore, I was looking and I didn't see it anywhere because it wasn't popular at that time. It just came out. And um, I thought I wanted to go to the lady and ask her, but then I kind of myself was too ashamed because she didn't know the book to ask her if there is a book called Dame Charm, which means charming but gut, but also in German charm, if you um, pronounce it a bit differently, it says shame. And when I was in the bookstore, I thought like, oh God, I hope this is the right title because I don't want to ask for this book. <laughs> 
So, so but much now about I our do, branding. We're not professional marketing people, and we're not very good at making thoughts like this in advance, but it still turned out well. <laughs> this is very good. Yeah. Over there? Yeah. There, <coughs> there is an industry, a big industry, called latrinology or latrinology, I don't know how you pronounce with big world federation and world conferences, have they ever invent, uh, in, invited you to give similar conference to, you, to their uh, world conference? And second question, do whales have a stomach? Who will what? Do whales? Whales, whales, they eat, they eat plankton, so do they need a stomach? Do they have a stomach? Whales, valfiche. If whales need a stomach... Do they have one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, about the first question... <laughs> um, um, I th we ha well, I have been invited more than we have been invited together, because as we said, oftentimes this collaboration of working together is a bit underestimated, in our view at least. Um, and um, so, but there have been invitations, but I can't always go because I work in a hospital, and so life is stressful enough. Um, but uh, the other question, if whales have a stomach, um, I would um, need a whole lot of knowledge about fish, maybe, to answer this. Um, t well, plankton is very small, so I think there has to be something to make it a little bit smaller and then you can absorb it in the intestine. And the intestine of the whale should be sort of similar because that system is just proven to work out sweet with all the little things and the little plique on it. So I think the small intestine should be about the same. And then if they use a pouch to store food, I, wouldn't, I would think they just open their mouth and collect it all the time. That's from what I know just from documentaries. So I would think they don't need a pouch to collect to have it saved because we have a stomach to also save the food for a while so we don't have to continue eating all the time. So I don't know if they have one, um, but I would think they need something to place some enzymes to make it even a little bit smaller, and then the vile should be the same. So it will be a second book? <laughs> Just about, and in the size so the whale can read it. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have some more questions? I think somebody's waving up there. I think there you... and there also. Yeah. There. There. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, that was actually my next question uh, or my question. Uh, do you plan a second book? And uh, if so, um, I don't know. How do you feel about the? Uh, I'm guessing immense pressure to perform as uh, as well as the first one. Okay, we'll answer that. But the lady there also had a question, oh. so she can. Um, yeah. Um, did you have to go through a process where you could actually understand the other's form of communication? Because I think people who read words don't always understand how to read pictures, and people who read pictures don't always understand how to read words. Mm. I'll do the first, and you do the second. Oh. Um, so about this next book, um, well, I feel like with this book, we really had a feeling like, oh, there's so much cool things to tell, and there's a really a perspective to be changed a little bit through knowledge. And I think we both really liked this challenge, and we had something to tell, and it went really well. So if this is the only book we write, we're very happy about it and content, And but we would only write a second book if we feel like there's a feeling like this again, like, oh, we really, there's so much to tell about this, and there could be a perspective changed. And then for me, it's also difficult to not talk about the gut, which is my absolute favorite organ, but really to understand the bladder or something like this. <laughs> so no, I mean, um, maybe, but maybe not. And that would be OK for us, too. So we are not under pressure to make a second book. If we have the feeling that we really want to, we do. But if we don't have, we don't do this, because this works for us well as well. Yeah. And your second question was, if we sometimes didn't understand each other because we had different points of view, one verbal and one graphic, yeah. I really can't, I can't really think of a good example when this happened. 
I mean, I think sometimes I ask my sister, she explained me something, and I asked her over and over again, so maybe she did it three times or four times, until I was like, okay, now I got it, and then I kind of structured it in my head and put it out, but sorry, I don't have a good example right now, do you? No, I think this was one of the things we realized early on, that on some level we know very fast what the other one aims for, and we don't even need to put it in words. Like The style uh, we're thinking in is very similar, but in words and pictures at the same time. So this was surprising to us too, but it made it probably artificially easy for us to work together sometimes, to say the least. Um, and then I think it's also a personal thing, um, just that my, my, my sister um, is very, has a lot of patience, and I don't have a lot of patience. So this balances each other out really well. Um, and uh, yeah, and sometimes my sister is like, oh, this is not so important, and I'm like, but this is important. And then we get to like a point where in the end we're like, oh yeah, this is the better way. Or, oh good, we had patients doing this rather like this. So uh, the personal things were there, and then coming from a pretty similar point. And um, I mean, not all of the pictures, but some pictures do have a certain certain um, way of humor. And Julia has the same way of humor than I have when I draw. And this was interesting because um, someone from another country um, came to us and he said, well, the French version is very good translated, but there are other books in different in other languages and some are not so good translated. So it's not so funny anymore in these other languages, but the pictures, they just stay the same. So they are uni universal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe we have time for two more questions, if there are any. Yeah, I think one up there. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm dyslexic, and um, when when I was a kid, I hated reading. When they when they gave me books for my birthday, um, I, I I was so disappointed always. <laughs> Um, and I, I just left them uh, on the shelf, never read them. Um, unfortunately, that has changed with time. I read your book, it's fantastic. I thought, wow, this is fantastic science communication. Um, but I used to read comics, and I was wondering if you are considering uh, uh, transferring your book into a, a comic format for, for kids, especially for dyslexic uh, ones. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, we already have thought about that, and maybe I will. I will see if this comes naturally out of myself. Right now, I'm pretty busy. Um, I do another project, and I have a little kid. So um, when, I, when he's older, maybe I start new projects. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for your uh, your talk. I'm afraid there is a, a main uh, contradiction in your talk. And uh, at the end you said you nobody uh, jumped uh, over each other's head. And I think we've seen a picture that proves it's not the case <laughs> at the beginning. So I was just, you know, kind of doing, that. that was my comment, but thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I should have worded it differently. Nobody jumps over each other's head anymore. <laughs> thank you for the correction. Very important. <laughs> and um, I just maybe uh, yeah. one final question there. <laughs> Can I just say one more yeah. thought? Um, because you said that you hated reading when you were little. So like now, right now, because my son is so little, I start this conversation with other parents and they go like, no, you can't let him watch TV. This is way too early and my kid is not w watching TV until, I don't know, um, he is 13 or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I can say that my sister loved to watch TV when she was young a lot and she didn't read so many books. <laughs> so I'm really relaxed and I let my kid watch TV when he, he wants to because I know that this is not making an impact on the life later on.
I ate a lot of candy and watched several hours TV every day. <laughs> it's true, it's just the truth. <laughs> I didn't watch so much TV, but <laughs> it kind of helped her maybe making up stories or something like that. But it's still science, it's not making up stories. I try yes, to yes, say yes, this yes. all the yeah. time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think this is a nice uh, note to end on. And thank you for your immense and wonderful contribution to science communication. Thank you for coming here today and sharing your insights with us. Thank Shall you. we give them a thank, thank you. you.